But I'm actually on my way to uh, an antique mall thing that they're having at the fairgrounds. Uh, I completely forgot about this until the other day that they were doing it again. I remember last year we went and we actually got some really good deals. So the plan is to walk through this. Hopefully it's still pretty busy and there's a lot of vendors, even though the whole COVID year, uh, I know last year was really good. But so the plan is to walk through and show whatever cameras we find, any kind of deals like that, kind of give you a breakdown of what it's worth and the condition that I find it, um, what they're asking for and all that kind of stuff and just see what kind of cool stuff we found, we can find. I know last year we found a Nikon S. Um, Chris bought an ancient lens, that this massive lens for a hundred bucks. It's worth like fifteen hundred to two thousand uh, dollars. I bought a Rolly for a really good deal. Chris also bought like four M3s uh, for a great deal. And there was a guy there who had hundreds of different cameras and stuff like that. So, hoping all this stuff is still there, and uh, it should be an interesting day. So it's all gonna be on my cell phone, unfortunately, sorry. Just because uh, I don't wanna be too suspicious, draw too much attention and have people question what I'm doing or how much they wanna sell certain things for. Uh, so I'm gonna try and keep it low key. Um, but yeah, so let's see how this goes. So I'm actually gonna be doing the commentating from here in my office. And of course, at the end, I'll show you which ones we actually got, uh, what cameras we ended up buying, what we passed on. Um, we actually got yelled at at one point, which We'll get to that towards the end as well. So yeah. So our approach for this is of course to do a walk around the entire building and get a feel for what's going on. Check out all the different booths that may have cameras. Uh, take a quick look, see what might be interesting, what we might, what we might be interested in, and then come back to the ones that we specifically want to look into more and perhaps try and make a deal on. This is for two reasons. One, it gives us time to make sure we don't miss anything important if we were to get stuck at one booth in particular. Uh, and then of course, it also gives us time to do some research on particular cameras or items that we see. Also, it helps to bring batteries, which I was prepared to do this time. And then I left them on the kitchen table. I always usually bring a battery for, uh, you know, the AE1, AE1 programs. I bring the little um, uh, X700s and cameras like that. You know, the XAs, all those ones use those little batteries. And then if I have an old Mercury battery, uh, that is, very useful because a lot of these older cameras take that old mercury battery and i can pretty much cover all my basics with those three different types of batteries so right off the bat we walked in uh saw this little booth here had these three little items here a little argus which i'm not interested in at all uh, then two lenses they were both off-branded i think a soligar and then uh, something else for either canon or um, you know the minolta mount one of those two if you want an inexpensive off-branded lens these are great options. You can probably get, I could have probably bought these for five, 10 bucks max. Uh, they were in decent shape. We kind of forgot the whole thing of making our rounds and then stopping. Cause as soon as we get in, uh, we, this guy was dead in front. He had this big, large format camera, but uh, Chris was definitely interested in this. This is his realm of expertise, anything medium and large format and all the little niche stuff that you have to have a lot of years of experience or done research on to know about. What's interesting about the large format camera is it actually had a aperture board, which according to Chris is pretty rare and uncommon. And then I went over to look at all the smaller things that I know a little bit more about. So Graflex right there, an older Mamiya C2 or C33 there as well. And then a lot of 35 mil you can see there as well. Uh, he had a Nikko mat, which I'm a big fan of. With the older 50 mil 1.4, um, not a fantastic lens, but not a bad lens at all. It is the older model. It has the uh, film wider on the bottom as well, which is a nice setup. Uh, and that could be used across a few different models. I did research that, but I'm assuming it can. Price listed on that is $175. That is above what it's actually worth, in my opinion, because this camera has not been tested. Um, it probably needs new seals. It was beat up. Film liners, they're hit or miss whether they're working or not. So it could have been working. It could have not been working. Again, that's why you bring batteries because there's no way to tell until you do that. They're very finicky. They're not as well built as camera bodies. A little Ricoh mat as well, which was rather interesting, but the price on that was, yeah, $125. And for a Ricoh mat, again, I'm not interested at all. I mean, the Ricoh 500s, which I've talked about before, go for about, 40 to 50 bucks. This Exa, 135 bucks, no lens. 
it didn't even work well, and those top dollar go for about a hundred bucks. So this Nikon EM listed at a hundred and ninety-five dollars. <laughs> no, just just no. Even if you're buying it to keep for yourself, not worth that price at all. Again, because that has more issues than most Nikons do, because it's their lower end model, uh, and it's not worth anywhere near what the other Nikon models are. Nikon eyepiece that I saw as well, uh, interesting. This Voigtlander was probably the most interesting piece to me, this and one other, but at the price points that they're listed at, not really. Uh, this was probably the best condition-wise camera he had, this Bush. Uh, it looked fantastic, the aperture blades, Shutter blades were all crisp. It looked like it really hadn't been used much at all or been taken very well care of. And then there was a Nikon FE with the Pancake 15mm 1.8. This one was priced at, uh, what was it, 140? So the shutter speeds all worked well. Um, it was priced at, yeah, 140. So not an awful price, but again, that is towards the top end of that value because you can see from the back, it's beat up. It needed new seals. Uh, it hasn't been tested again. I couldn't battery test it, so it's a big gamble at $140 because if I have to sell it for parts, I will lose money. So after we finally left that guy's little booth towards, uh, we stopped at this next one, which was uh, kind of a one-off. He just had this old Konica auto reflex. Now this is the first auto reflex. So again, we picked it up, looked at it, tested all the shutter speeds, worked well. I'm not a huge fan of the auto reflex bodies or the Konica bodies in general. The build quality isn't that great. Lens quality is pretty good, um, but the build quality on their SLRs is not great at all. I've had horrible luck with those. Um, so we did some research on this after we left. Nice little lady. She said it $40, it was ours. These are the best build quality of the Konica auto reflex line. It's also the first of the series. So they go for about a hundred bucks, give or take on condition. So at $40, um, knowing that it worked pretty well, that wasn't an awful investment. This is a Baldock Set 2 uh, is this model. So the issues with this camera was that one of the uh, brackets that keeps the lens straight was completely missing as well as the screws. So instead of the lens being facing you front on, it was tilted off center, which means none of your images are gonna come out properly as well as focus. Uh, and it's just not going to come out how it should be. So as far as the body is concerned, it's pretty much useless unless you can replace that part. Uh, I think I can get that 3D printed. I know some people and the other bracket is still there. So I can have that as a model and 3D print the other side. So that would fix the problem. <clears throat> it doesn't fix its value really at all with a 3D printed plastic part compared to the original parts. But the lens on this one would have been the most interesting part. The lens worked well, didn't seem to have any issues. Could use a cleaning, of course. Um, but the lens worked fine and it's a medium format lens. This was priced at $25. Um, so another one in this booth, only two cameras in this booth, well besides that crappy Nikon, was the Kony Omega. Now this is similar to the Mamiya press cameras uh, as far as size, build, all that kind of stuff. It was kind of on the same time frame, kind of their competitors to that. Uh, this guy had it priced at $100. You can see it has the viewfinder on it, everything like that. So we uh, took note of that, obviously, and we'll check on the prices and that come back later. This guy, nothing super interesting, some lenses, um, a bunch of Kodak little reflexes and stuff, an Argus you see there. Uh, he did have an Exa that I was interested in, had a lens, uh, had everything like that. It was in great condition. He had it listed at 80 bucks, um, and the pin on the back to pop up the lens hood was busted. So that kind of kills that for me, and $80 is really towards the top end of that model. He also had some of this random stuff. This is the cool thing about going to the antique shows. Just all these little random knickknacks and old dark slides and film developing stuff and everything. This was his $5 bin. Developing powder, which I'm sure does not work, but all just this little cool stuff. Some Zeiss glass there. Um, I thought about getting that and I didn't. I probably should have. Not sure what it goes to though and where I would sell it or how I would sell it. This was actually in an old box we almost skipped by. So this is a Bush. This is the American competition to the Graflex. Uh, it was rusted, corroded, the lens looked awful. It did have a bunch of dark slides for it, which is cool. Um, he wanted close to $400 for this, which at this stage in its life, 
um, is probably just parts, unfortunately. This guy just had a bunch of Kodak um, folding cameras. Nothing spectacular. These, there's really no market for these. People use them literally as shelf pieces. If you're a collector and you collect these, that's fine. But he's wanting 40, 50, 100 bucks for all these. And there's no room for margin on that. There's no need for these, um, anything like that. The one interesting one he had was this piece here, which was an old, I can't read the name on that, but he wanted 150 bucks for this. And I actually picked up one of these not too long ago for I think 40 bucks, 50 bucks. And great condition they're worth about a hundred bucks this was an old bin outside this is pretty much just parts both of these bins look like they had been dunked in water everything was corroded everything was messed up um uh, there was some minolta xms there was an old uh voigtlander something rather in there some argus some polaroids uh just nothing worth investing any time or money into because he's going to want 10 15 20 bucks for each one of those and they're Barely worth that in parts. This gentleman was here last year, uh, and I believe I still have footage on my phone from his booth. Uh, this guy, Chris, ended up buying, I think, four different Leica M3s, um, as well as uh, a few other parts and pieces and things like that. This guy has anything you can want, he's got it. And all condition-wise, he's got Canon QLs, he's got Voigtlanders, he's got, he had Leicas last year, I'm pretty sure he sold all of them last year. Um, I mean, he's got Canons, he's got Exactas, he's got Nikon, F1s, F2s, Nikkor mats, he's got Voigtlanders, there's the F1s, um, Contacts, Keeves, Canon QLs, Canon EFs, he's got the uh, Yashica Electras, keep scrolling, keep scrolling, all the lenses and accessories for Leica, the Nikon S and um, Contact series, all that stuff. Loads of stuff, and he couldn't even bring anything. And he couldn't even bring everything either. And then I love how I shot this in slow mo too, just to make it more dramatic. There's probably like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28. There's probably 28 different rollies there, uh, if not more. And he probably has more in boxes and probably has more at home. Plenty of rollies, if that's your thing. Here's a little close-up on some more stuff. A Pentacon 6. I've always wanted one of those. Konicas. Um, Voigtlanders. There's the Contacts. Some, a few of the older Leicas. The Olympus XAs. You know, all of it. There's all the Rollies. Jeez. It's got a little darker in here, hasn't it? Let me just bump that up a bit. Cloudy Novercast. Completely missed how that changed my exposure. Sorry about that. But it's more dramatic now. It's kind of cooler, don't you think? I like it more like this. That's why I always shoot at night. Trust me, all those cameras are great. I could have spent a lot of money there, uh, but I just don't have the space and don't have the need for them. And surprisingly, a lot of them need work. Um, he hasn't used them in ages, so they all look great. They've been well taken care of in storage bins, I'm sure in a closet. But this year compared to last year, it seemed like a lot more of them had fungus issues. A lot more of them were broken as far as film advances and things like that. And I don't want to insult this guy because I know he's put a lot of time and effort into collecting these and I know he knows what they're worth. But at the same time, for me to take them and for me to keep them is one thing. For me to take them, repair them and keep them is another and repair and sell them is even another thing. So right now I don't really have the time to take on 20, 30, I mean dozens of projects that need to be recleaned, repaired, all that kind of stuff. And then also it gets a little sketchy when you see that they all look great but then three out of four of them either have fungus issues or a film advance or something is broken. So it's like, okay, well, what's wrong with the fourth one? And then what else is wrong with the other three? So it's something to keep in mind, because remember each camera is different, but if they're all from the same lot, they've been owned by the same person, they've all been stored the same way, you're gonna have to assume that they all have similar problems. The Pentacon had fungus in both lenses, which mean they have to be completely disassembled and clean. The body seemed to work well, he had it listed at $375. Those go from 100 to 200, 250. Uh, so already I'm gonna have to be like, hey, in great condition it goes for 250, you're wanting 375. I have to take apart both these lenses and clean them and hope that there's no lens separation. So I'm max, I'm looking at like 100 bucks. So that's a steep decline compared to what he has listed for it. So. What did we get? 
What did we not get? What did we come back and see? Of course, we came back to the large format camera. Chris is very interested in that. Uh, he did not buy it that day. Today, however, he might have bought it. I need to text him and check. But he was very interested. He had, of course, get his wife's approval. I think the guy wanted about $850 to $900. I think Chris talked him down to about $600, maybe a little bit less. Uh, and that left him some room for profit. He's going to have to sell the body separate from the lens. And I think he wants to keep the aperture board. So he can kind of double his money. But again, he's going to have to go through the whole process of cleaning all of that listing it, taking pictures, describing it, making sure everything works properly. This guy did not even know what it was worth. He didn't know what worked and what didn't. He had the wrong lens board on the camera, or sorry, he had the wrong film board on the camera. He didn't even know what film boards went to it and what were from other cameras that he had sold or whatever like that. This is why you do your research. Explain to who you're talking to what the prices are what the kind of the condition of them are. So maybe his price is accurate if that body is in good condition, but don't be afraid to tell him like, listen, if you look, this is in this, it's worth this much with a lens in good condition. This one, it's corroded. You can see it has issues. There's no lens. Maybe this isn't working properly. Maybe it's broken. Maybe it has rust on the back. Maybe it needs new light seals, which is 10 to $15. And if you compile in four or five different cameras into one, you get a good deal on all of them and he gets rid of some stuff he doesn't know anything about and he's trying to sell anyways. And honestly, at those prices, he'll probably hold on to them for a while. So we went back to the Konica Auto Reflex. Now here's where we ended up having a little confrontation. So we came back to see it and then her husband uh, was there. As soon as we walk into the booth, he just starts yelling. And I thought, I thought he was joking at first. So I turned around smiling, even though you can't see it in a mask. He said, 50 is the best you're going to get on that. I know you were here earlier and you talked to my wife. 50 is the best deal you're going to get on that. And it's a great deal. It's a great camera. I was kind of taken aback. Um, so now all of a sudden the price has jumped $10. I'm going to check everything on the camera now if I'm going to end up purchasing this camera. So, you know, I'm opening up the film door, checking all the film shutter speeds, all that kind of stuff. Uh, checking the light seals, checking the front. There's no lens on this camera as well, by the way. So uh, then I go to try and open the battery compartment to see if there's a battery in there, see if it's corroded, all that kind of stuff, because you know that's gonna be an issue. The camera will function without a battery, uh, but as far as resale value or use, if you want a light mirror that works, you have to have a good battery compartment. So as I'm looking at that, he grabs it out of my hands and says, no, 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 that's not how you do it. And he's like, this is the knob you change to do that. And then you pull the film, the film goes over that way, and then the, you press that button and it takes pictures, it takes great pictures, it works perfectly. Hands it back to me. At this point, I'm getting a little irritated. You know, I said, okay, I know how I know how a camera works. Yeah, that's that's how a camera works. Like, but I'm I'm trying to check the battery compartment, uh, and it's not opening. It's like if it doesn't open, then you know there's there's an issue. There's probably a battery in there. It's corroded or something. He says, you break it, you buy it. I'm just trying to open the battery compartment. So he said, okay, well fine then. Grabs the camera out of my hands again and says, if you don't want it, you can't buy it. So me and Chris look at each other and like, okay, shrug our shoulders, start laughing and walk out of the booth. At this point, I'm not having any of it with this old guy. I guess he was insulted that we were questioning his knowledge of the camera or the fact that somebody who's gonna buy something, I can't return it. I wanna make sure that it works properly. So we did not buy that Konica Auto Reflex and I don't have any hard feelings about it. I ended up buying the Baldic set just because the lens I think could be interesting um, to mount on a different camera, something like that. I want to kind of try and have that part 3D printed, could be interesting. It's a, not a great camera. Um, prices I saw on eBay were about $100, but there wasn't a lot out there. At this point, I'm just buying the lens and for $24 is what it ended up being. Chris ended up buying the Kona Omega. And here it is. This is a lovely little camera. And by little, I mean extremely large. Like I said, this is uh, the Konica version, I believe. I can't quite remember who made this. Um, excuse me, I haven't done all the research on it yet. Uh, but this is kind of their version of the Mamiya press camera. So Chris ended up looking this up. Again, this is why we leave, walk around, we can look up things like this and then come back to it. This 50 millimeter viewfinder right up here itself is worth about a hundred bucks um, just for this little piece that just pops off. Watch me break it now. Uh, and there you go. And it's 
Wow, that's really nice. Uh, this is just for composing, and then you have your viewfinder down there. Focus is over here. This is your film advance. That's different. Good condition, it's clean, a little dust on the exterior, uh, but other than that, nothing serious. He wanted a hundred bucks for this camera, and a hundred bucks is what he got. Again, if there's issues, then we have issues, and we have to go back and figure out what's wrong with it and take care of all that kind of stuff. Um, the viewfinder is about a hundred bucks. The camera itself, I'm not 100% sure. I'm gonna say anywhere from one to two, three hundred bucks. So, an interesting purchase. And now I am tasked with testing it and making sure it works, because that just seems to be what Chris does lately. And I'm okay with it. So that was kind of our day antique shopping. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to ask down below, comment, let me know. You can always message me on Instagram. I will respond to you as quickly as I can if I have the proper information. Thank you to everyone who's made some purchases on my store uh, as far as buying some of the cameras that I no longer need that is continuously being updated. I have 10 or 15 different lenses now that I need to put up there for Nikon, Canon, things like that. I apologize for the delay in this video. Been busy. I have four different videos in the works. I just have to edit them, put it together. A lot going on, but uh, thank you for watching this video. Hope you found it useful. Make sure you like, subscribe for future videos, and I will see you in the next one.